she said, I, I taught for about 40 years, so anytime anybody stands before you who's been a professor, it's not that they can't talk long enough, it's that they can't <laughs> shut up when it's time to shut up. So I had my wife come today, and she's, she's got a distinct <laughs> a signal for me. So anyhow, uh, thanks for coming. It's a good group. I've been to, uh, to several of these and always enjoyed each one, so hope not to disappoint anyone. Uh, this is, uh, in the background here, just some slides of uh, all projects I've done. So uh, I've done little things, small things, utilitarian things, uh, things I'd rather forget about. <laughs> uh, but that's part of the creative process. Uh, I like the uh, intention. You know, uh, I was talking to Kim and she was suggesting different months had different uh, themes and the theme for July was uh, intention. And so I really like that and I like the uh, illustration that they had too where intention is upside down. And uh, that is so true so often. I grew up in small, small towns across Nebraska. Never had an art course in uh, grade school, high school. Uh, just didn't have them. Uh, I never had a vision of myself as an artist, as a, as a creative person. Uh, we lived out far west in the Panhandle and we'd go picnics on Sabali Canyon and Monroe Canyon and they had uh, streams that ran through there and I built a dam every single time we went there and and so just the idea of working with my hands and doing things was um, always seemed important. It's interesting when you look back you can see these very direct patterns and how one thing follows another but when you're in the midst of it you cannot see it at all. I mean it's just happening and uh, and in my creative career, the same thing. When I was uh, a young student, I did certain things that I had no idea what I was doing and had no intention about where they were going, but I'm doing some of the same things now. You know, so looking back, walking back down the path, we can see where we've been and we can see we can see where the seed was and we can see how it grew up and how it turned into something else. My intention in high school was to get out of town. I mean, that's, that's the first real intention I know. I, uh, I lived in a couple little towns. I lived in Harrison and Far West. I lived in Wisner and went through my junior year in high school at Wisner. That was the big town I lived in. There was 1,100 people. And then I moved to, uh, the family moved to Greeley, Nebraska, which uh, has about 600 people. Actually, probably, that's probably overestimating. I graduated in a class of eight from high school. So as we all like to say, we were all top 10 students. <laughs> <laughs> Not many people can get away with that. I went to college just because my, uh, my parents were both college educated and, and that was always assumed so I never questioned that and it was out of town. I had a dreary freshman year because I didn't know what I was doing, what I wanted to do. Uh, my sophomore year I took a uh, ceramics class and, uh, and I was just hooked. I mean that was it. My intention from that time on was to be, be a creative person. All even at that time, I didn't think of it as creative. I just, that's the only place that I felt really comfortable. Two things, one, in the art studio, I was totally comfortable. Listening to the Beatles, I was totally comfortable. And, uh, and the same is true today. I mean, if I, if I want to, uh, put myself in the right creative mood, all I have to do is play Beatles music. You know, even if I don't know the words or anything else, it was just uh, the vibe of the whole thing. And, uh, and so that was my constant playlist 
uh, all the way from, um, well, from 62 on. That ceramics class I took, I think that was the first art class I took in college. And uh, as it turned out, the teacher had, uh, first of all, Westland had never taught a ceramics course before. First day in class, we made clay by throwing all the ingredients in this big metal bin, and we took our shoes off, and, and I was like making wine, you know, crushing the grapes, only a little bit messier. The uh, professor for that class was uh, assigned that class because he was the uh, 3D guy, but I swear he had never taken a ceramics class in his life. So his answer was always, read the book. <laughs> I think I was the only one that read the book. Because I, uh, I ended up being the, uh, I was a work study student, so I got my job taking care of the, uh, the art labs. So that was perfect, because then I had a key I could get in and out anytime I wanted to. And, uh, and I could spend as much time as I could. I was either out playing basketball in the playground, or I was in the art studio, and that was, that was it. That's where I needed to be. Fortunately, it came very easy to me. I don't know why. I think uh, my grandparents, my grandfathers were both farmers and carpenters. And uh, so part of that came uh, back when I grew up, every little kid had a pocket knife, and, and they'd pull it out and carve pieces of wood or something like that. That was just kind of the way of life. Uh, nowadays, you get sent home from school for having a deadly weapon if you did that. Uh, so just, just different times. I ended up uh, designing the kiln, building the kiln, firing the kiln, loading the kiln, unloading the kiln. And after about three or four weeks, all the students came to me if they had a question about anything. And so uh, by that time, I'd kind of figure out how to throw in the wheel because uh, uh, our, what was supposed to be a professor of it uh, had never thrown anything on the wheel and, and I don't think he ever mastered it. So anyhow, um, on one hand that was very good because it, it made me seek out, it made me research, it made me find out how to do things and to use books. Uh, I always liked reading anyhow, so I got that. The short side of that is that there's a lot of things I should have known that I never did know. And, uh, and eventually I ended up teaching ceramics for, uh, for decades at, uh, at Bellevue, along with sculpture and drawing, lots of other things. The whole intention though was to, uh, from that time on, was just to be a creative person. And, uh, it's interesting because as a, um, I guess as a human being, as a personality, I was very, uh, uh, I was very closed within myself, you know, going into an art, an open studio with no other people, that was a wonderful thing to me, because then I could avoid all that personal stuff. But on the other hand, in my creative life, uh, I was able to read, I was able to listen to what other artists had to say and what they did, and I could do that with an open mind. You know, I couldn't be open-minded with other human beings, but unless they were creative beings. And so that was kind of my guide. In fact, my first, uh, first real inspiration of sculpture was uh, Nam Gabo. How many people in here know who Nam Gabo is? There we go. My wife does. <laughs> and another guy. Uh, Nam Gabo was an uh, early 20th century Russian constructivist sculptor. And um, I saw his, his works in a book. And, and uh, one of the works I saw was a uh, sculpture 100 feet tall in front of an apartment building. I think it was built in the late 40s after the war. I uh, read all about it. It was built in a shipyard, and they used to uh, lift him in a crane up. They were building it horizontally, so they used to hoist him up in, uh, with another crane so he could look down at it and see what it looked like. 
And just all of that stuff just thrilled me. And, uh, you know, that's, that's what I want to do. I mean, I hadn't done, any, uh, hadn't done any welding at that time. or Actually, the closest thing I had to a, uh, uh, art classes in high school is I had a welding class once so I could get out of a study hall. And I had a wood shop class my senior year. But, you know, I, I love that stuff. And uh, anything done with my hands, uh, I have to, anything I do has to involve hands. Even today, I may sketch something out, uh, some ideas, but I can only go so far with it, and then I need to make a model. I need to turn it into three dimensions. And then, because my mind works in a, uh, in a three-dimensional way rather than a two-dimensional way. I've been looking at a lot of uh, different sculpture gardens around the country and saw actually three different ones in the past, well, this week. And uh, some of them, just the placement of sculpture is just horrible. And, uh, and one of them was really, really good. But, you know, it's like so much of it's so much of that is done by people who have a, um, a two-dimensional view of the world. And when you have a two-dimensional view of the world, you just can't place things in space. And there's, there's such a, a vast difference between the two. And so I uh, yesterday I talked to George Newbert, who was, used to be director at Sheldon and really developed the sculpture garden in Lincoln, and, and we had this discussion again. I've had these discussions with George off and on for 40 years, so that was, um, so we were right. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we agreed on, that we were right. As far as intentions, I, uh, so, my direction is creative world, what happened is, uh, my uh, junior year in college, I'd had uh, one sculpture class. I think I was maybe in my second sculpture class. And uh, my mother found an article in the Omaha World Herald, and it was about a, uh, a statewide competition for a sculpture for the city county building in Lincoln. And uh, suggested that maybe I would be interested in something like that. And so I applied and, uh, uh, to that competition, statewide competition. I won the competition uh, over my professors, of course. And uh, we were always kind of in a standoff relationship anyhow. But anyhow, I built a sculpture 25 feet tall. So, you know, I didn't want to make little things. So my first sculpture was really 25 feet tall. That was. Uh, this is 1968, 69 it went up, and, uh, and I made enough money from that that I didn't have to, instead of going to work the next summer, so I pay tuition for my next year in college, is I, uh, I got in a program that took me to uh, Graz, Austria. On my way to Austria, I, I was on a student charter going over, so I took the bus to the bus to uh, Chicago and, and about a block from the bus station was uh, Picasso's big sculpture that had been put up a year before. Uh, it's, uh, does anybody know the name of that sculpture? Nobody knows the name, they all call it Picasso's Chicago. Actually it's Head of Woman is the name of it. Kind of an ugly woman, but <laughs> woman nevertheless according to Picasso. So anyhow, you know, I looked at that and I thought, yeah, this, this, this is it. I mean, that's, that's it. So, so that summer in Europe was very pivotal. If you've ever done travels overseas, uh, it's, it's a grand awakening. And uh, so I, I traveled by myself for about three weeks and then it ended up in Graz, Austria. I, Spent a week in Paris, spent a few days in the Riviera, and south of France, across Italy, back up to Austria. And then in Austria, I had for two months, I went to school. We had classes four days a week, 
and uh, in art history, Renaissance art history from one professor, and uh, the other one was, uh, was contemporary Eastern European art. And uh, my professors, one was uh, from Kiev, Germany, the other one was from uh, Prague, uh, Charles University. And what they did is they, they educated me on what a real professor is. Because their knowledge of their fields were so encyclopedic, it was unbelievable. The lady from Prague, I would take walks in the afternoon with her and we would walk around uh, Graz and one of the jobs she had had in uh, Czechoslovakia was to, uh, to go to every single church in Czechoslovakia and analyze all of the architectural detail and she could take any architectural detail of which there are thousands on these churches and she could date it you know, within about 20 years of the origin of it and how it formed and everything else. And it was just fascinating to me. And the, my other professor, we would go out to a guest house in the evening. It had a lot of benefits. We'd go out with him and he would always buy. He'd buy the wine, he'd buy the cheese and the mates and he'd keep it coming. So there was French benefits to go with him. But anyhow, he uh, had been a... Uh, drafted into the Nazi army in the Second World War and, and he used to, uh, he'd fall in these moods, he'd start talking about his experiences in the war and being in these castles in France and, and breaking up Louis XIV furniture and frames off and just to build a fire to stay warm and, and just survive and then the tears start running down his face and extremely emotional and uh, uh, and then on the other hand, he would talk about trips he made to Moscow and going up in people's houses and second, third floor and taking pictures he weren't supposed to be taken out the window of, of different things in Moscow. And, and so he had that adventurous spirit too, which was, was just wonderful. Uh, but really, that experience that summer uh, kind of opened my eyes that, you know, I could... I could be a teacher too. That, you know, maybe being a professor wasn't that bad because, you know, once you get through grad school, you know, you, you have to find a job. Probably chiefly on the, the fact that I'd done that large sculpture link and I got, got into graduate school at Syracuse. And uh, Syracuse, the uh, Roger Mack, who was my lead professor there, casting was his field. And so metal casting was something I really wanted to learn. And so we started, we started there. And, uh, and that was a wonderful experience. Uh, I was there two years. We came back to, uh, I'd been uh, married right before graduate school. I had a young daughter. We moved to Omaha uh, because I couldn't find a job anywhere is what it was. I, uh, some of my fellow classmates were sending out as many as 500 resumes. I sent out about 125 because I couldn't think of 500 places I'd really, <laughs> I really want to go to. Actually, there wasn't 125 either, but I ended up getting a job uh, teaching. My first teaching job was creating prep, and I taught there 72, 73 school year. And the only reason I got that job is because uh, a woman whose lawn I was mowing and a house I was painting was a golfing partner of the president of Great Prep. <laughs> That's how you get art jobs. <laughs> <laughs> and everything works. And then I continued to look, well, I, I had that job for a semester and then at the uh, end of the semester, uh, the Jesuit I replaced was coming back, so I had to find another job. So I got a job welding tank trucks at Fruhoff. So some of the big gas tankers you see running around, I made some of those. And about a month into the second semester, uh, the Jesuit got sick again. They called me back, so I went on day shift at Great Prep and night shift at the factory. And then I was living in a, a little apartment 
and I had a garage, so I had a garage with no electricity and no heat that I was trying to make stuff in. And uh, because I was, I still wanted to continue my sculpture career, but I had no place to work and nothing to do, so, so that was really, um, it was really kind of a, a difficult time to keep moving. And then right at the end of the year, I, um, I was making my last calls. It was August. I was making my last calls for the year, looking for another, looking for a teaching job, because that's ideal if you're a creative person, you have a place to work, you have a, a, the right atmosphere, and so forth. So at that moment, I called. The call went in to the uh, dean of the college. And at that moment, in his office, the uh, guy who taught, one of the guys who was teaching art at Bellevue was being promoted, actually it was a demotion to uh, dean of students. Uh, anytime you go into administration, that's definitely a demotion. Uh, I went in the next day for an interview, got the jobs, and you know, I thought, eh, two or three years here, and I stayed 38. So it was good, we developed a really nice program we, uh, uh, and it got terminated in 2011 or whatever it was, so that's when I quit. So, it's sort of the rise and the fall. But at the same time, what it did is, um, as I found out I like teaching, I found out that, um, that you know, the one-on-one -on -one with students is, is really something I enjoyed. I, you know, I hated the grading part, I hated you know, the administrative parts, but it, uh, the camaraderie with the, uh, the students was really uh, quite extraordinary. And um, actually, we had a lot of adult students, especially when I taught, and I think it took me about six years before I was as old as the average age of the students I was teaching. I started doing some commissioned work and, uh, and made my... Um, yeah, as we talk about intentions, I, uh, you know, I'm probably the most creative I've ever been right now. I will be 70 in two weeks. <laughs> Being alive is a good thing. <laughs> and, uh, you know, if you're around things that are happening all the time, if you're around younger people, if you're around young ideas, uh, you know, there is no, there really is no age. And you don't worry, you know, when you first start, start out as a creative, you think, oh, I gotta be original. You know, everything's gotta be totally original. Well, that's a bogus idea to start with. And the idea is that everything evolves from something else either from me or somebody else. Uh, and one thing I always, I like to go to conferences, I like to hear other artists that I, that were doing things that I admired. And because I could learn from them, you know, I don't want people to say, oh, you're wonderful. There is no benefit in that to me. But if I hear people talking about what they're doing and talking about their own ideas, uh, then that's very stimulating to me. The idea that something is totally original is, uh, has always been a myth. And uh, the more you work, the more uh, it's stimulation around you. It's what other artists do. It's ideas that are floating in the air that just seem to land here and there. That's what you're really looking for. And that's what really drives you forward. One of the things I discovered early is that it is really hard to make money creating art, especially if you're creating things that you just want to create for yourself. It is really, really hard. It's hard with painting, but with sculptures, uh, it's terrible. And so I had to figure out how I could keep making, making my own art in my own studio and pay for it. You know, my teaching job was to support 
myself and my family. And all that money always went into the pool to support the family. So what I had to do is figure out how do I survive as an artist? And how I figured it out is uh, a great story. Okay, in uh, 1971, I was a graduate st student at Syracuse University. And uh, if you don't remember the late 60s, the early 70s, those were wild and crazy times, let me tell you. So the director of the local museum, the Iverson Museum in Syracuse, decided to give Yoko Ono a, a one-woman show, the whole museum. And so uh, in October of 71, John and Yoko came to Syracuse. And it was like, oh, you know, it was like, and then what they did is they invited several of us students at the university to come and make Yoko's work for her. And, uh, and so John and Yoko came, and so every day for a week, I got to go down, and I'd sit with uh, John, and we'd drink tea and coffee and chat about this and chat about that. And Yoko was always right there at uh, John's side, and I never, I never once heard her utter, utter a word. She didn't talk to us, she didn't tell us what she wanted. Uh, and every once in a while she'd whisper something to John and John would tell somebody to go do something. And, and that was it, but, but he was totally personable. You know, he'd sit down, chat with him, he'd talk to anybody. And so it was like just a great week. But what I did is I ended up making a um, uh, clear plexiglass maze eight feet tall, 16 feet square for Yoko Ono. And you know, all the square corners, all clear panels. And then on the very inside, put two-way mirrors. So if you made it all the way to the inside, you just disappeared. And so it was pretty cool. And then of course we put a, uh, this was the 70s, we put a toilet right in the middle. Oh. Well, at the opening of the show, somebody Somebody crapped in the toilet. <laughs> in the 70s, that was a good thing. <laughs> I think they would look at it with a more sanitary view nowadays. So anyhow, um, so I mean, it was just a great experience. Then on Thursday of that week, October 8th, was uh, John Lennon's 31st birthday party. So, um, so we got together, we got this big cake, looked like a grand piano, a white grand piano, because Imagine had just come out, and it was a big song then. And, and here we are, we're just around the table with John and Yoko, and we're singing Happy Birthday, John Lennon. I mean, how, how do you get there? I, I was like, man, I'm, I'm just a kid from Nebraska, you know. How did I get here? You know, how did I get here? I was following a creative trail that led me there. And then about a month after the show came down, I got a call from uh, New York City from one of uh, John and Yoko's gophers that says, yeah, we need you here. We want to, uh, they were doing a uh, kind of a re uh, techno reenactment of the uh, 1913 uh, armory show in New York at the uh, Lexington Street Armory, which was, the same one the original Arma uh, uh, show had been. And so I was the only one who knew how to put the maze back together. So, uh, and I didn't even draw plans, I just did it. And uh, so they flew me in, I got to go down to there, they had a walk down in, uh, in the village and everything else. The weirdest, weirdest, strangest people in the world were there. And, uh, and again, me, you know, I was just, whoa, you know. And uh, so that was a great experience. But, you know, what, it, what I learned from that experience that I put to work a few years later is that if I cast and fabricated artwork for other artists, I could afford a bigger studio, I could afford more equipment, and... Uh, and I could make enough money doing that that it would support my own sculpture habit. Probably over the years, I've never, I've never come out ahead on 
making my own work. However, over the years, I've come out ahead by, uh, by providing a service to other artists. And what it did for me personally is that I always have to be making things. I can't, I can't sit down, I can't, you know, I just can't be, I gotta be making things. And I do all the time. Well, if I just made all work of myself all the time, I would have warehouse after warehouse after warehouse full of stuff. As it is, I have the, the world's greatest uh, collection of Brunian sculptures. <laughs> <clears throat> have, a, have a feeling it's gonna stay that way too. Uh, but what it has allowed me to do is get to know a lot of other artists. I had clients in San Francisco and Chicago and New York and, and a lot of local too. And it allows me to keep working. And what happens is, is I learn with my fingers. And, uh, you know, there's nothing I can't do. Just ask me. <laughs> All right? So if I don't know how to do it, I will figure out how it can be done. And uh, it's that process. Like I have a hard time, you know, sculptures need maintenance, you gotta, you know, repaint them, you gotta fix them, you gotta do stuff like that. It's almost a painful process to do that because, uh, you know, it's the journey of making something that really interests me. It's, it's not the sale, it's, not the maintenance of it, it's that creative process that you go through. I mean, that's the, that's the vitality of, of any artist, is, is that you, you need to go through that process. And so I continually put through that process. And now I got, you know, I got three guys that work about half time each or so, uh, helping me and, and my, uh, <clears throat> the way I conduct my shop is, is almost more like a, more like a, a mentorship. Uh, uh, it's almost like a medieval guild, is that you learn things and you apply things and then you do this and then you do that. And, uh, and the idea of, of learning and, and when they're ready to go, they go. If they want to stay longer, they stay longer. Uh, there's no contract to sign, there's no, uh, uh, they essentially work the hours they want to work and it all gets done. I've always liked the model of the uh, Art Students League in, uh, in uh, New York City back early in the 20th century where the uh, artists taught and whoever wanted to sign up for classes signed up for their classes. They learned to do what they did there was no grading, uh, there was critiques of course, but there was no grading, there was no pressure, it was, a, it was a learning opportunity. Which brings me to the hot shops. Uh, one of the jobs that I took in my studio was to uh, do a lot of bronze work for Walter Scott, who was uh, uh, Keywood CEO and chairman of the board. And uh, he built a new house out on Lake Cunningham and he, uh, uh, he wanted a lot of bronze. I mean, I did gates, I did railings, I did light fixtures, I did, I did some uh, screens in front of fireplaces which were so big it was like standing in front of a semi. And, uh, but I made money and probably the first and last time in my life I had a pile of cash. Well, at the same time, uh, I had worked with, uh, with Tim, my partner in the hot, hot shops here, and Ed, who's in the glass studio, and we had worked on projects together around town, architectural projects, doing different things. And, uh, and we sort of toyed with the idea, well, wouldn't it be nice if we just had one big building, we could all work in the same building, we'd work together and cooperate and help each other. And so that was kind of the, the spirit was born and then eventually we found this building. And uh, this building was far more than we thought just, you know, maybe four different studios. Well, this building is 92,000 square feet. 
we uh, had meeting after meeting after meeting, and so finally we hired a lawyer, and then we asked people for money, and then most of them went away. <laughs> Fortunately, I had that pile of money that, uh, that I got from Walter Scott, so enough to buy my way in anyhow. And so we, uh, we had to change our whole plan. Now all of a sudden, not just our, our studios, the hot shops itself, but we had this whole big building to use for other studios. In order to get a loan to buy the building, this is totally no man's land back in those days. I mean, people live in, in, the, in the trees and bushes across the street. Nobody would walk through here at any time of day or night. And, uh, and so we decided that we, could, uh, that, that we could do it. So we formed an LLC, and, uh, and we, so different people own different, different parts, different uh, amounts of the total, and uh, put it together. And we had to have, in order to get the loan approved, we had to have uh, people sign leases. And so all the floors had been cleared out. This was sort of mattress to start with. And then it had been just storage of junk for a lot of years. And somebody trying to sell office furniture out of the lower level. And then also all the, where the hot shops are, it was being rented to someone storing cattle feed in bags. And it was just floor to ceiling feed and fertilizer, whatever the hell it was. But, they ruined the floors, I know that. So we had this big party. Pizza and beer. I mean, that's, that's kind of the common denominator here. And so we had a big party. We invited everybody, invited everybody they knew. A whole bunch of people showed up. And, uh, and on the floors up above here, we put uh, masking tape on the floor. We actually mapped out studios on the floor and says, you can have this one or this one or this one, or we can move the tape. <laughs> and so one party, we had over half the building rented out. We had signed statements. I mean, there's no way we could have held them to those signed pieces of paper, but, but the banker took them. And, uh, you know, when bankers look at something like this, when they look at, uh, you want to do what? You know, what, what they have going rolling around in their mind is, there's a bunch of little Van Goghs, we're going <laughs> to lend them money. And uh, so what really happened is, uh, we ended up getting, uh, uh, all the banks in Omaha were interested in, until they found out what we're doing, I think, is what it came down to. <laughs> So we ended up borrowing the money from uh, People's Bank and Council Bluffs. And the reason we were able to do that is Ed over there, he had taught uh, some blacksmithing courses before he uh, was working in glass. And one of the people who took a blacksmithing course from him was uh, the head banker. And so I went in, talked to the banker. The banker understood what we wanted to do. And that's the only reason you got it. It's just like mowing the lawn, you know, of the woman who played golf with the president of Creighton Prep. I mean, that's how connections are always made. It's always, it's always serendipity. You know, your intention is to keep moving ahead. But all these other things, it's serendipity. And you never, you never know who's going to uh, give you that key that you need to keep moving forward. It's pretty much uh, Tim and Ed and I, and uh, you know, a uh, shareholders meeting is uh, when we run into each other in the hall. <laughs> and uh, Tim, <laughs> yeah, this is, a, it's a crazy model. But it works for us. It works for us and we've been true to our mission. We've had pressures against Ed, we've had pressures to make money. Uh, this is not making us rich. We're all paying rent. We're paying utilities. 
the building's worth more now than it was when we bought it. You know, so any value that we have, any money that we have is wrapped in this. And the trouble with owning real estate is uh, it's not money until you sell it. But we're not interested in selling. We're interested in, in our vision of helping others uh, find their way as artists. That's it for me. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is great. I still come down here every day and work practically every day, whether my wife wants me to or not. So. <laughs> Thank you.